Grace and peace be yours from God our Sovereign and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 The other look, week when we took a look at the story of the anointing woman, we talked about how the gospel writers often would conflate two or more stories into one. And we saw how Luke took Matthew and Mark's story of the anointing woman and changed it to meaning almost totally by switching the situation in which the anointing took place. And then later John combined some of Luke's story with some of Matthew and Mark's story and came up with his own unique version of the story. It's not unusual for stories to get joined together. As often the case, when they are joined together, it changes the emphasis. Tonight, it is the church that is doing the conflating by joining together the story of Jesus' final supper with his disciples in John's Gospel with the story of the Passover from Exodus, along with Paul's words of institution from 1 Corinthians. The result of joining those stories together is that most people interpret John's last meal as being identical with the Passover meals of Matthew and Mark and Luke, <coughs> the, the meals that give an account of the institution of the Lord's Supper. And by doing this, they downplay or weaken the message of John's Gospel, they, namely Jesus' new commandment, and they make it become subordinate to the institution of Holy Communion. Now, I'm not suggesting some great nefarious plot by the framers of our lectionary, but nevertheless, the juxtaposition of text does indeed change the emphasis of what we take from Jesus last week and diminishes by neglect the church's practice of discipleship. After all, it is the essence of the Christian life to be a disciple. And discipleship is captured in the concepts of servanthood and nonviolence, both of which flow out of deep love. What I'm suggesting is that maybe what we need is a sacrament of love. Today is rightly called Monday Thursday. The name comes from the Latin word mandatum, which means command. And in John's passion narrative, Passover occurs on Friday. And the Paschal lambs are being taken to the temple for slaughter at the very same time that Jesus is being tried and whipped and crucified. In other words, in John, Jesus is slaughtered at the very same time as the Paschal lambs are slaughtered. Thus, for John, he becomes our true Passover lamb, the one who liberates us from bondage to this world. But for John, that is Friday's emphasis, not Thursday's. Thursday's emphasis is on the new commandment. Jesus' command is to love one another as I have loved you. It is an invitation to all who would follow the way to live their life in the imitation of God revealed in and through Jesus. The command is a command to servanthood not as a law, but as a natural end byproduct of loving one another. This, along with Jesus' command to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you, which is a call to nonviolence, these two commands form the foundation of Christian ethical behavior, servanthood and nonviolence. They are 
the way of Jesus. This way, said Jewish scholar Joseph Klossner, this way was an element in Jesus' idea of God which Judaism could not accept. He said Jesus' teaching was not proved possible. His exalted ethical ideal has been relegated to a book, or at most has become the possession of monastics and recluses who live apart from ordinary life. Judaism could by no means agree with it. And this has also been the case with Christianity since the time of Constantine to this present day. This analysis from a non-Christian scholar needs our careful consideration because it helps to explain one of the core reasons why Christianity has gone so wrong over the past 1700 years since Constantine. By becoming a pro-empire state church, it got into bed with emperors and with kings, with dictators and presidents and with big business. And it had to become comfortable and okay with enmity and exploitation and colonialization and racism and anti-Semitism, militarism and war. True faith became defined by orthodoxy, that is, by believing the right things, rather than by orthopraxy, doing the right things, or following the way. As a result, Jesus' command to love our enemies and his command to love one another have become commingled with and shaped by the values of this world. And for the most part, our lives and our ethical behaviors reflect more the ways of this world than they do of the kingdom of God. They reflect a mere shadow of Jesus' way of servanthood and nonviolent love. We are imitating the God of our fanciful imagination instead of the God who calls us to a radical new ethic. But the only God that we are to imitate is the God who is revealed by, in, and through the Word made flesh, Jesus, who could not have expressed more clearly in what the imitation of God consists when he said, I give you a new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. The commands to love one another and to love your enemy are a call to servanthood and to nonviolence, which are the fruit of unconditional love. In a book, A Death Like His, Emmanuel McCarthy writes, Jesus did not simply suffer and die, just as Abel did not simply suffer and die. Jesus was tortured and murdered. And he responded to his torturers and his murderers with a nonviolent, merciful love. 